everyone. Happy Tuesday. I'm Jeremy. I'm Alan. And you are officially tuned into the GG Dispatch. Each week on Tuesday, bright and early, we consolidate the week's biggest headlines in gaming news. Whether you're listening in on your commute, during your workout, or you just have us on in the background, we want to thank you for listening in. And speaking of thanks, another kind thank you to the folks at Audio Technica for providing the microphone that Alan uses, the AT2020 USB X. Whether you're just starting out on your content creator journey or you're a seasoned pro, Audio Technica has the products for you. So, Alan, how have you been? How was the weekend? How are things? Oh, the weekend was fantastic. So, uh, kind of had a little hurricane in our part of the country, but thankfully, n- not not too bad in our neck of the woods specifically. Okay, uh, so, good. other than that, the House of the Dragon season two finale, and what a finale it was! Like that episode had a lot going on because uh, you know they are trying to like push things forward. Sure. Um, you know, not, they're not they're not dragging their feet. Things are moving quickly, and the way it ended, it's not a cliffhanger, but it ends in a way, in like the most hype AF way that you're like, I need this season to hit like this fall, please, not next year. But I know there's right. no way it's gonna happen. It's gonna be sometime next year, or maybe even 2026. Who knows? Um, I don't know what like what. I, what I had heard that it was like. a two. I heard that it was two years. I heard it was 2026 before. Yeah, yeah. Because I was, I was seeing some memes that were like, when you realize that after Sunday, you're going to have to wait two years for the next House of the Dragon episode. So I think the next season isn't until 2026. You uh, just ruined my Monday, Jeremy. Like, I'm sorry. That much. <laughs> that, I'm sorry. That's, that's how that's good okay. that's that episode was. I'm like, two years. Oh, no. Oh okay, no! Well, we'll wait, the two, wait, two year wait between the first now. and second season felt like an eternity. Blah blah blah. I'm looking at this article from Men's Health. This isn't an official first story. I'm just reading this. Um, says uh, House of the Dragon will continue. They ordered season two on June thirteenth. Um, and when will it come out? Good news. Most likely should come back sooner than the nearly two year period between season one and season two because there won't be a strike and everything else. However, uh, it is an expensive show that looks as good as it does because the people behind the scenes take their time. We are likely looking at a 2026 release date. But You're breaking could my have heart it. in real time right now, Jeremy. It, I need it you says, to know that. It says, <laughs> it says early spring, maybe, instead of summer or fall. So maybe like 16 months, 17 months, instead of 24. Sorry, Alan. That only hurts slightly less. I'm sorry. But anyways, um, I also, okay, so you're telling me that the ending was like hype, hype AF. It wasn't really a cliffhanger, but it was just really good. I've been hearing yeah, like, on okay. online that yeah. it was kind of boring. Like, was it boring? Was it like, was it like a lot of exposition and stuff? Like, was there no, you're, you're, action? Showing, or? So like the way I like to describe this season is kind of like, so the season one was sort of like, you're entry into the world you know here's who these characters are their motivations and it's kind of sort of setting things up for everything to come this season was more like the players are putting their pieces where they want them to be before shit goes down and like okay. season gotcha. three is where it goes down like that's that and that finale is kind of like okay yeah we're gonna get some insane stuff going down in, se- in season three and that's what i mean by like it ended in a moment where it's like you're not necessarily like you know a story-based cliffhanger it's more of a it ends on a note where you're like okay i'm gonna be i'm really excited for what i'm seeing and if i'm excited like this excited right now i am gonna be insanely excited when it actually like when when we see everything kind of come together in season three right okay um Okay, well that makes sense. I I, I, but I, but I think honestly, that makes sense in terms of like I, the story story building and stuff. Yeah, I don't understand why people would say it was boring. Again, it's it's kind of having to show you what where everything everyone is kind of plotting and getting ready for what's to come. Mm-hmm. Some hype moments. There's callbacks to Game of Thrones going down. You're yeah. like, yo, this well, not is- really a callback, oh. right? Like more of like foreshadowing because it's before it, right? So, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. yeah. so it's kind of like well, it. It makes references to to Game of Thrones, right? Sure, sure. Um, yeah. and so 
I don't I like I don't get like the whole it's boring thing to be honest. And also there's like this one character who is just an absolute joy on screen. Like I loved every second of that specific character. I'm hoping that you see this sooner rather than later so you can kind of like get it. But it's a great character. I don't want to go beyond that. I don't want to tell you anything other than that, but like sure. in a in a episode where it is like it's very serious and like, you know, people are kind of getting ready for 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 what's to come like it sort of re- worked really well to kind of like break break that up a little bit with a comedic aspect, and I really liked it. So, okay, watch it, Jeremy. Cool. I I'm going to. I I, I have it on my list, um, and I know I said I was going to dive into it. I'm still very excited to do so. Um, however, I wasn't watching House of the Dragon. I did watch something new though, uh, which was uh, Prime Video's Caped Batman Caped Crusader. Um, so I've watched the first few episodes of this. I, I posted my first impressions on the site as well. Uh, this is a new Batman animated series uh, from Amazon Prime, from Prime Video. And it is, I think, awesome. Um, it definitely invokes a lot of the same like nostalgic feeling of Batman the Animated Series, which uh, ran back in the early, uh, you know, in the 90s and uh yeah, in the 90s into the early 2000s. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it, the, the show ended. Well, actually, no. When did it end? I know I, I put this I put this in the article. Hold on. Because it's been a while. Uh, yeah, it's the last episode of Cape Crusader was like in 1994. So it's been like 30 years since Batman the Animated Series ended, actually. Um, and but this like say this definitely has a lot of the same kind of vibes from like the intro it's a very like noir kind of intro kind of very subtle and restrained opening theme um the aesthetics are awesome um it's it's batman in this sort of like 1940s period it's funny there was like an article where they were like when does this batman take place and they were like (laughs) figuring out okay let's look at the technology that's available and let's look at the architecture and let's look at the outfits and everything else and they basically figured out that this is essentially like 1940s gotham um and yeah so it's just been really cool they they do some really interesting things with some of the rogues gallery so you know the penguin isn't uh isn't a guy it's not oswald it's o- oswalda copperpot um and she you know it's kind of like a different take on that uh commissioner gordon and barbara and like uh, all the characters are just slightly tweaked and just a little bit different but right away you kind of see where they all they all fall of course we have harvey dent uh ultimately who becomes two-face but you know he's still a, a da as the series begins like he's still this is before the accident and everything um and yeah so these first few episodes have been really great the voice acting too i mean of course uh, no no voice is going to replace kevin conroy who uh will forever in our hearts at least for you know my millennial heart be the voice of batman um but um there is definitely some great voice acting in uh the series you know, any driver plays oswald the copper pot um and hamish linklater is batman um you know and he, i think he does a great job as both batman and bruce wayne kind of like in live action sometimes there are actors who can do batman really well and there's actors who can do bruce wayne really well but maybe not both but for this voice actor i feel like he really encapsulates both, both really well um but yeah i've been that's what i've been watching kind of quick uh, quick hits kind of villain so, of the week kind of type of so for that show yeah uh was it made to appeal to the people who are like kids in 1994 and would watch it now as adults or is it also aimed at kids kind of like the way it was in 94 and it just so happens that people who watched it back then as kids will enjoy it now even as adults i think it's a little of both honestly i think i think that you know at least from what I've seen so far, there's nothing. I think it's TV. I want to say it's TV. It's actually TV 14, I think is the rating, but there's nothing like really um, grotesque or violent about it. And so I think it's definitely something that parents could 
watch with their kids if they're like hey i'm really into batman there's this new animated series and they can kind of watch it together uh and then it also has the nostalgia factor so i do think it's a little bit of column a and a little bit of column b yeah um but yeah i've I've been really enjoying it if you're a fan of batman uh and you enjoy animation uh you should check out cape crusader i think you'll enjoy it i'm gonna share the rest of my thoughts once i finish the series and then uh uh, of course, I have to watch some House of the Dragon as well. So that's my that's my homework. And Fallout. Uh, <laughs> and Fallout. <laughs> yes, I know, I know. Um, okay. So, but enough about all that. We have some stories to talk about. We've got four stories today, uh, starting with a heartbreaker, a real heartbreaker, uh, which is Game Informer shutting down. Uh, this was uh, this news broke a few days ago. Uh, this is from Jay Peters at The Verge. Game Informer is shutting down after 33 years. One of the last remaining gaming magazines is shutting down. The GameStop owned publication announced this on Friday. The magazine's entire staff is being laid off, Kotaku reports. In a statement posted to X, the publication didn't give a reason for the shutdown. GameStop didn't immediately reply to a request for comment. Last year, year, GameStop CEO and Chairman Ryan Cohen told staff that every expense of the company must be scrutinized under a microscope and all waste eliminated, according to an email obtained by Kotaku. In March, Game Informer introduced uh, a way to subscribe to the magazine directly. Previously, you could only get the magazine by buying issues on their own or through a GameStop Pro subscription. Hard time, quote, hard times, layoffs, cancellations, and closures have impacted thousands of game developers and publishers, as well as other outlets like us that celebrate games. Uh, Editor-in-Chief Matt Miller wrote Game Informer's blog post about the announcement. After we first published this article, the link to the post directed to Game Informer's shutdown message. Uh, we haven't been immune to that hardship. Uh, here's the full shutdown statement from Game Informer's X account and Game Informer subscription page. It says, the final level, fa- farewell from Game Informer. After 33 thrilling years of bringing you the latest news, reviews, and insights from the ever-evolving world of gaming, it is with a heavy heart that we announce the closure of Game Informer. From the early days of pixelated adventures to today's immersive virtual realms, we've been honored to share this incredible journey with you, our loyal readers. While our press may stop, the passion for gaming that we've cultivated together will continue to live on. Thank you for being part of our epic quest, and may your own gaming adventures never end. Um... And that's that was that. Uh, almost immediately afterwards, the website also went down, including all of the old video reviews, articles, images. Um, it all got nuked pretty much immediately, um, much to the dismay and disgust of many uh, online who, at the very least, were hoping that, you know, it, some of that could be maintained or at least archived for perpetuity. And there is some, some action happening to try and grab whatever people can from any cached pages or anything like that, where, where they can try and archive things. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, devastating, like really devastating uh, news. Um, not wholly surprising, but still hurts a lot. Um, I don't know, Alan, what, what were your thoughts when you heard the news? So, like, I was completely shocked that, like, there was still a magazine around, like, at all of any kind yeah. in 2024. Like, because I remember going as a kid, right? Like, you go into GameStop or whatever, buy a game, trade something in, and they'd like, oh, why don't you become, you know, a GameStop member or whatever? And you get Game Informer. I think it might have been free for, like, a year or maybe, like, a year for, like, a buck or something. Um, and I think I, I, yeah. I, I might have got it was like oh a dollar sure why not um but like i didn't even know that i was still going um but i feel like it's kind of a shame that there isn't at least a space for one at least to kind of be able to like be viable and survive like i know that you know we're all very digital now and people you know read on their ipads or their phones or the kindles or whatever but it'd be cool to have at least just one um because like was this a monthly like well that would come out like every single month or was it yeah. like a quarter or something like that? <laughs> no, I'm pretty sure they were still on a monthly publishing schedule. Yeah. Okay, so like I think it, I'm I think that I feel as if there can be a space for like maybe something like once a quarter. Sure. And I think it'd be sure. still interesting to have because they can cover the game industry in a very different way. Because like I feel like online it's very much in the here and now. 
It right. It's, it's a very get. immediate. Yeah. Like get the, you know, I think Greg Miller was talking about this, right? Like get the, get the headlines out, get the SEO, like, you know, just yeah, yeah, you got to get story that traffic, run. you know, uh, yeah. Uh, but in, and you have to also try and, you know, in essence, beat everyone else to the punch so that you get the traffic and not, you know, the other websites. So yeah. I, I hope that maybe, you know, the staff can kind of come together and, and develop their own idea and, you know, obviously she will probably only be able to be less, I think, print just for, for, for viability, like maybe once a quarter or something like that. Um, but I think there should still be a space for something like that, just because it does give you different opportunities to do different things and to, as to what information you bring to readers. Yeah, exactly. And um, so as an aside, a couple kind of tangents or asides, First, when you talked about kind of like the quarterly uh, magazine idea, um, folks out there who are like anime aficionados, uh, maybe remember New Type. Um, this was a, and I think, I don't know if it's still ongoing. I don't think it is, but I'm happy to be wrong. But New Type was like this kind of deluxe, oversized magazine that would come out. I want to say, I don't think it was monthly. I think it was every quarter like that. Um, and it had, you know, like previews for upcoming anime and, you know, kind of deep dives and things like that. And I just remember like wishing that I could get the subscription because it was such a, like, it felt like such a luxury to have this huge, beautiful magazine, you know, that, that came in every, every two to three months. Um, and I could definitely see a video game version of that potentially doing well, right? Like to, to give it a bit more breathing room so that it could do the deep dives of the stories, right? Like it, it does serve as a stark contrast to the internet age of information, right? Like, you know, we're, we're not looking for the quick hits. We're not looking for the 400, 600 word quick articles that are going out, basically just summarizing what everybody already knows with a couple extra SEO keywords in it. Like, something that gamers could pick up and read and learn a bit more about like the inside baseball, a bit more about like the development process, you know, it's like the kind of reporting and detail that you get like from a Schreier article or something like that. You know what I mean? That could have some appeal. And so I could definitely see, um, see that, uh, being, a, a viable model. Um, and then the other kind of, uh, um, tangent that I had or aside was just, you know, in terms of the Game Informer and GameStop partnership, um, it it's interesting because it is sort of like a double-edged sword, right? Like GameStop, we know GameStop has been a mess. Like we don't know how a lot of their stores are still open, right? Like they've been struggling along, you know, they had obviously their, their kind of heyday with the stock and everything and uh, Wall Street bets and all the other madness that happened back in 2021. But other than that, it's just been like kind of straggling along. And and yet it was that partnership with Game Informer and tying it into their subscription service, et cetera, that kind of gave them these last, you know, the better part of the last year, maybe a little bit longer, right? Um, so so on the one hand, great. Thanks, GameStop, for for keeping them alive. But on the other hand, also, what the hell, GameStop? Like, if you if they were able to kind of get it together and figure out a way to properly monetize and grow the platform, I feel like Game Informer as an institution could still be running strong and be you know continue to be a part of the video game you know space right like it would be sad if the magazine stopped right like if Game Informer came out and they were like hey you know what um, we're going fully digital like you know thanks to all of our loyal readers for the physical magazine subscriptions and you know all these awesome covers that the artist created etc cetera, etc cetera. like thank you for all your support but we need to go digital only and here's a way that you can support us right like by by shifting to this digital model and gamestop could have driven that transformation right like they, they could have pivoted that that way but they didn't um and so i, I'm surprised I feel like that was say, we're gonna spin you out but like you're off on your own now. You got to make it work. If you can't make it work, I feel like they kind of did. I feel like they kind of did, right? Because that's essentially what they did when when they said, you know, basically when when Game Informer was like, "Hey, 
the subscription isn't tied to the game uh, GameStop uh, members anymore. When they were like, "Hey, you should subscribe and like you know get the magazine," feel like that was GameStop sort of like cutting the cutting the cord and like, "Hey, yeah, you need to go and like try to survive." Um, on your. But own. when did that happen? How long ago was that? I mean, I don't know. I don't know the exact date. Like maybe six months. Like maybe three or six months. I'd have to look, but you know, but yeah, I mean, like that's what I'm saying is like if they did th- they did that and they were like, oh, it didn't work, and then they like shut it down, right? But I feel like GameStop instead of saying that could have could have said, hey, this isn't working, right? Like here is what you need to do to survive. Let's pivot. Let's go digital. Here are some resources, right? Like we're gonna try and because we think that the institution of Game Informer is important to keep in the space we're willing to make the investment to in this, in this Avenue, in this way to keep it up and running. Right. Um, But I do wonder like what went down because if they really did say, okay, you're on your own, go make it work. Like, wouldn't they have had an inkling of like, Hey, we are not getting there with these subs. And like, they would have tried to do something like that. And and by them, I mean like the editorial staff, you know, the, the leaders there at game informer, it seemed like everyone was just kind of like shocked and odd and then uh you know for GameStop to then just completely take everything down it feels like a lot more like ill will yeah. or animosity towards Game Informer like I don't know if they really gave it a fair chance to survive yeah I I don't know I don't know I mean again I'm just kind of thinking out loud here like the ways that Game Informer could have survived and here's the thing like they will survive in a way, right? Like the, the creatives behind Game Informer, you know, the editorial staff, the writers, you know, many of them will go on and do some great work on a variety of different platforms, right? They'll, we'll see them pop up as freelance contributors for Kind of Funny or uh, for The Verge or Kotaku or any of these other outlets, right, in, in the video game space, or maybe they'll start their own thing, right? Maybe they'll, they'll, they'll do that online video game magazine design and kind of take it in and run with it. <clears throat> um, but, but, you know, again, I, I, w- I just wish that there was a little bit more consideration in trying to maintain it as an institution because 33 years, it's a long time. <laughs> it's a long time, you know, for a magazine to be around, um, you know, that, that's you know 33 years it's at 1991 right um and you think back to what video games looked like in 1991 um just for for some context uh let's see what what games were released in 1991 uh sonic the hedgehog uh, streets of rage street fighter 2 super castlevania 4 um yeah you know it's all you know the you, you know yoshi <laughs> um uh, Home Alone on the Nintendo, et cetera, et cetera. So like all these games, right, that now we're Final Fantasy IV, all these games, you know, were at the start of Game Informer uh, and they've weathered the storm since, you know, since the Super Nintendo days uh, and through many, many generations of games, through the dot-com boom, through everything, right, that they've become enmeshed in many generations of gamers um, and how they get their news, whether or not you agree with how they rate games, whether or not you agree with whatever, right? You just know that it's part of the industry and it's part of the gaming community. And it has been, right, for the better part of the last three plus decades. And now it's not. So how would you sucks. bring back Game Informer? Like if you if you brought, brought back the, the crew, what would be your plan of like, okay, here's how we make it work in 2024? I mean, I I do think that it, it wouldn't be um, it wouldn't be physical. I think it would be digital only, and I think it would you know it, we would just do we would just run it like a website, right? Like we we would have um, a similar kind of design as you know as Kotaku as The Verge, etc. But tapping into that base right that familiarity with the brand right because branding carries a lot of weight to it so i feel like you know there are game developers that had always hoped that that would they would get into a copy of game informer or have their game on the cover of game informer right um 
so seeking that prestige, I think, could still get you some great interviews, some great exclusives, some, you know, some some unique stories that you wouldn't be able to find anywhere else. So it would be an online magazine. And then depending on, you know, whether it's patrons or Patreon or subscriptions or, you know, however the monetization would look, uh, maybe there would be at certain tiers, right? There would be a physical magazine on a quarterly basis. So if you, if you, you know, subscribe to a certain level every three months, you get a limited edition kind of printed copy of the magazine to say, Hey, thanks for all your support. And it consolidates a lot of like the biggest stories from those last three months. Maybe it has a really cool spread, really cool cover. Um, and again, kind of appealing to folks who want that physical media and we're re also rewarding those who are willing to invest a bit more and put a little bit more of their money into, you know, what they want to support. Maybe that means you only print a hundred of those magazines every quarter, right? Now you've got yourself a collectible. Maybe it's more, but then that means there are more people that are supporting you, right? So that would be my approach. And again, like I don't have an MBA. The website that I run is small, <laughs> right? Like it's a little corner of the internet. I'm not presuming to to know how to how to heal all of gaming from former's woes. But if it were up to me, if I woke up tomorrow with the keys, that's what I would do. What would you do? Yeah, I like that idea. But I, what I, what I was thinking of is like, wouldn't it be cool if you did like a really nice, like very much like a monthly magazine that they were doing, and have it even release it as like a PDF or like a, on on like you know on uh, Apple News, right? You like on the iPads, like a uh, a lot of magazines do a really nice job of making it feel like sort of that magazine layout and have right have like right a digital format, and yeah. then at the end of the year, take the stories that the community love the most and put that into a physical magazine. Mm, that, like that the best sense. of. Now, it becomes yeah, once yeah. a year, much, and in my opinion, even more viable than the quarterly. And everyone kind of gets to have a say of like, this is what resonated with us the most. And I think people would be really hyped. I feel like one magazine is really nice in that, like you said, you're getting something that is really meaningful without it sure. feeling like, oh man, I, like these magazines are starting to stack up real quick, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I like that idea too. I think, again, I think either one would work. I, I think at the end of the day, you know, monthly print magazines for the, for this medium, right. For this hobby space just doesn't work. doesn't make sense. Um, but I think either a quarterly or an annual to your point that, that makes a bit more sense. Um, so anyways, I am bummed. You know, uh, game again. Game Informer was a big part of my, you know, early gaming life. I, I remember, uh, you know, seeing them on the newsstands and and seeking out those issues when I would go to, you know, uh, when I would go into GameStop or, um, you know, getting it rolled up in my mailbox and just being able to kind of dig into those stories, uh, you know, kind of flipping to the back and seeing the summary of scores from like the previous months, for example, uh, and that sort of thing, like you know, in case I missed a review and I was like, oh, wait, what did they think of this one? And I could go and find it really quickly, kind of like looking in the yellow pages. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a bummer that it's, that it's gone down, but I'm hopeful that the creatives that were involved in Game Informer will find, uh, find alternative outlets and that we'll, we'll have a more robust and rich ecosystem of gaming journalism as a result of this, uh, dispersion. So We'll see. Um, all right. So that's story number one. Story number two uh, is a two-parter uh, of Bungie in trouble. Uh, so uh, the first story from IGN uh, from Wesley and Pool: Destiny developer Bungie cuts 220 staff. Some of the most difficult changes we've ever had to make as a studio. Uh, Destiny, uh, Destiny developer Bungie has today announced significant, uh, and this was about a week ago at this point now, uh, has announced uh, significant cuts at the studio that has seen 220 people or 17% of the studio's workforce let go. The cuts affect every level of the company, including most of the Sony-owned studio's executive and senior leader roles. Bungie boss Pete Parsons said in a post on Bungie.net, today is a difficult and painful day. Uh, departing staff will be offered a generous exit package that includes severance, bonus, and health coverage Bungie promised. Parsons blamed the cuts on the rising cost of development. 
industry shifts and enduring economic conditions. Because of this, Parsons insisted Bungie has had to make substantial changes to its cost structure and focus development efforts entirely on live service looter, shooter, Destiny, and the upcoming marathon. The cuts come after what was seen as the successful launch of Destiny 2 expansion, The Final Shape. Parsons acknowledged this in the post, but said they were necessary to refocus our studio and our business with more realistic goals and viable financials. Parsons also said that the cuts were made after exhausting all other mitigation options, although he failed to mention what those options were. The 220 layoffs come alongside the integration of an additional 155 roles, or 12% of Bungie's workforce, into parent company Sony Interactive Entertainment over the next few quarters. Parsons said this move saves a great deal of talent that would otherwise have been affected by the reduction in force. That suggests that if Sony hadn't taken those 155 roles, 375 staff would have lost their jobs today, and that the actual reduction in Bungie's workforce over time will be substantially more than 17%. I'm going to pause right here. So this, I mean, say what you will about Pete Parsons. This is the kind of thing I'm talking about, right? Like I mean, I had mentioned before when we discussed layoffs, like opportunities to reappropriate resources internally should always be explored, right? So um, I am glad that for those 155 folks, at least for now, like maybe it's, you know, frying pan fire sort of situation, but um I am glad that they have a place to land um, because otherwise it would have been, you know, the, the layoffs would have been much higher, right? Like 50% higher. Um, How much more. of that do you think was just like Sony seeing the situation going like, crap, we're going to look really bad. Let's just try to find 155 spots <clears throat> and then, you know, slowly bleed them out. I mean, I don't know if, I mean, I don't know how much Sony cares about the optics on this. Like, I don't know how much Sony is like, because we'll get to that in the second part of the story. Right. But like, I don't know how much of this is, would be like Sony saying like, Oh man, like we messed up. Right. Like this is going to look like we messed up uh, versus this is going to be people pissed off. At I know. Second article. Might, might I know. That. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. We'll get, we'll get to that in a second. But just like, just kind of reading on this, I think, that i don't think it's sony saying like this is how we save face i think it, it i think they could have absolutely let bungie lay off 375 people i think yeah it would have looked bad but it already looks terrible so another 155 heads like overall in terms of payroll that's high like that's not cheap so I don't think sony would do that out of like pity or even like an op thing i think they would only really do that if it made sense for them as a company to retain those that talent for other projects right because they may have thought well how much is it going to cost us to like replace these 155 people you know what i mean like how is that going to impact our development timelines etc cetera, etc cetera. so i i do think that it's less about them saving face for bungie and more about you know corporate strategy in my mind you're right jeremy these corpos they don't care <laughs> yeah, I mean it's. I mean it's true. I I think, yeah. I I I'd love to think that they listen to our podcast and we're like, hey, you know what? You're right. We should listen to Jeremy and like figure out how to repurpose some of the staff when, instead of going through layoffs. But I think <laughs> I think it's just they they were looking at it like, hey, 155 people. That's a lot of hiring. That's a lot of time for recruiters. That's a lot of onboarding ramp. Yeah, basically cherry picking whatever talent they feel will make it at at Sony proper. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. Uh, the article continues. Meanwhile, Bungie is working with PlayStation Studios to spin out one of its incubation projects, an action game set in a brand new sci-fi universe, to form a new studio under the PlayStation banner to continue its promising development. Parsons did not say how many staff will leave Bungie to form the studio, but did admit that there will be a time of tremendous change. Based on the information provided by Parsons, the total size of Bungie pre-layoffs was roughly 1,300, so the number of staff leaving to join this new PlayStation developer is somewhere around 75 this also means can i stop you for a second yeah yeah isn't that just absolutely wild that like to me i read it as like sony came and is like no we're taking that from you because you've already broken everything else and this has yeah. some promise to it and so we're <laughs> gonna take it and then work on it yeah yeah that is pretty wild that 
that Bungie was like, oh, and we have this other game that's happening and Sony basically is taking it from us because they can't trust us to finish it <laughs> or like they don't want us to kill it because it does have that promise, which is which is super cool. I do also think, you know, it, it's kind of another twist to the knife to the folks who got laid off, right? Because, again, I don't know how the internal workings of all of this looks, but you have to imagine that there's some sort of like divvying up of resources for various projects. Right. And so you got to know that there were two out of those 220 people, there were probably a good handful of them that had their hands raised to be part of this project. That's getting spun out and saved by Sony that said, they said, no, you know what I mean? Like, no, you're going to stay working on this other thing. And now they're getting laid off. Right. Versus if they were able to get onto this project, they would have been safe. Like, so, you know, if if you're somehow working at Bungie listening to this and that would have been you, I'm sorry. That fucking sucks <laughs> because, you know, like, it's just a matter of like the how how the, you know, how the bones. That was the life right? boat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, OK, so this also means the actual percentage of people leaving Bungie proper as a result of the restructuring is about 34 percent. There was an update from Jason Schreier that said later on Wednesday that it's closer to 40 people moving to the new studio as opposed to 75. So far less than the initial reporting, but still a decent amount um, for this smaller studio. Parsons went on to explain how Bungie got to this point, confirming that the studio has been running in the red after its financial safety margins were exceeded following delays to both the final shape and marathon and a rapid expansion that stretched our talent too thin. Over 850 staff remain at Bungie Building, Destiny, and Marathon, Parsons said. Um, in, in March, multiple sources, and then there's his statement. I'm not going to go through the whole statement. You can find it online. Uh, in March, multiple sources told IGN that Bungie was in the midst of shifting around its creative leadership on Marathon, including removing longtime Bungie designer Christopher Barrett from the game director role. IGN learned he was being replaced by former Valorant game director Joe Ziegler, who left Riot Games for Bungie in 2022. At the time, IGN was told that Bungie was pouring resources into getting Marathon out the door. The game's direction had shifted somewhat under Ziegler's new leadership, one source said, including moving away from custom player characters in favor of a selectable cast of heroes. There were also internal fears and rumors that layoffs would immediately follow the release of the final shape, with one source saying, nothing adds up. Uh, sorry, quote, nothing adds up, end quote, end quote. Something will need to happen to curb costs unless the final shape does so well to cover the gap and people can move to Marathon, end quote. Unfortunately, those fears have now been realized. Um, so, yeah, um, NASA layoffs at Bungie freaking sucks. And then, if that wasn't bad enough, uh, Former Bungie worker claims studio and faced insolvency without Sony acquisition. Um, this is a report from Kat Bailey uh, that posted a few days ago, uh, again on IGN. <clears throat> Bungie misrepresented its finances and had significantly overextended itself when Sony acquired the studio for $3.6 billion in 2022, former workers claimed in a new game file report published in the wake of Wednesday's layoffs. It was apparently bad enough that at least one source described as a well-connected worker went so far as to claim that Bungie faced dire consequences of the acquisition hadn't happened, saying the alternative history is insolvency. Their comments paint the picture of a studio that was struggling despite the success of Destiny and Destiny 2 due to supporting too many projects and other problems. Following the Sony acquisition, game file sources claimed Bungie repeatedly missed its financial targets, leading to roughly 100 employees being laid off in November 2023. A second round of layoffs followed on Wednesday, impacting another 220 people, or 17% of the studio's workforce, with another 155 being integrated into Sony Interactive Entertainment. Bungie is also spinning out one of its incubation projects to form another studio, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, within Bungie, the layoffs had been anticipated for some time. In December 2023, IGN reported that the feeling within the studio was that it faced more reductions if the final shape didn't do well. But according to Game File Source, even the final shape being a major blockbuster success couldn't have stopped the layoffs. Indeed, with Destiny 2 on the wane some seven years after its original release, the final shape reportedly failed to outsell the previous expansion, Lightfall, despite being a critical success. Um, 
Former Bungie workers and other members of the games industry have been vocal in the wake of layoffs, with many of them blaming the studio's leadership, led by CEO Pete Parsons. Their sentiments were echoed by those in Game Files report, claiming that Bungie sold things they were just not able to deliver. Parsons, for his part, blamed the cuts on the rising cost of development uh, and enduring economic conditions, and saying that they, you know, that the company had been running in the red. Um, so, so yeah, I mean. <laughs> Bungie got bought by Sony for a pretty penny. I'm trying to think. Okay, three point six. It was, yeah, three point six dollars. Um, hold on one second. I need to check something. Um, how much did Disney bought Lucasfilm for four? Okay, well that was in 2012. I have to do some adjustments for inflation. But they bought Lucasfilm for four billion in 2012. Um. I mean, so you're talking about, well, let's see, inflation calculator. Let's run the inflation calculator really quick. Um, but I'm just, I'm just saying, like, it's not so far off. Um, let's see. How many, not, there's nine zeros in a billion, right? So, and that was in 2012. Calculate. Oh, it wants me to use values less than 10 million. Come on. How am I supposed to do my math? <laughs> well, either way, I think the point stands. Like, I think even with inflation, yeah, it's about thirty. It's about thirty-eight. It's about thirty-eight percent. So, so if we looked at four billion, thirty-eight percent, so it'd be like five point two. Um, so even still, like you know, an extra billion and a half, right, to get all of Star Wars, uh, and all of the licensing and everything else, right, and they paid. 3.6 for destiny <laughs> for Bungie and destiny right which is crazy um but, yeah. i mean it felt crazy at the time because yeah it was mostly just destiny like what it shocked me at the time that they bought that for that much yeah. i'm like it felt like there's no way this company is worth this much unless they see something in terms of sales of like oh wow the, you, we have to pay 3.6 for that uh, 3.6 billion for that my question yeah. is like how did that even happen? Because in the original report, which is a game file by uh, Steven Totillo, it basically almost made it sound like there was financial fraud, to be honest. Like, it almost felt yeah. like what was yeah. being stated is that, like, Pete Parson, the CEO, was making claims that were 100% just fabricated. Right. So I'm not a lawyer, but that sounds like kind of illegal, you know, I mean, again, yeah. not a lawyer, but that yeah. feels kind of illegal. So it I'm like, it definitely feels like there are some, there are probably as a result of that. I mean, here's the thing. If there's a report, chances are there are already, there are lawyers that have been having meetings about this for like six months, probably already. <laughs> um, but you know, that's it's not a small thing right like if sony entered into this contract to buy so you know to buy bungie for 3.6 billion dollars it's because bungie was representing a certain forecast for revenue forecast for sales forecast for you know any number of things right um and that those numbers or the or the state of the company was just not being presented accurately like at all <laughs> um so you know it may not have even necessarily boiled down to you know parsons like cooking the books or like crossing out a you know crossing out an eight and making it a three you know for like debt or something right like um but it could have been like not presenting the whole picture right maybe like a lie by omission or just you know junk that's been hidden under the bed or in the closet that Sony only unveiled after they bought and after things started catching on fire. Right. Um, so yeah, again, I think, and this goes back to my earlier point where I don't necessarily think that Sony, you know, integrated 155 roles into their company to try and save Bungie or even necessarily like save their own reputation. I think at this point, they're probably pissed at Bungie, but it's still more of like that strategic view of like, okay, Bungie F this up. 
but we're not going to, you know, throw good money after bad or like we're not going to like throw the baby out with the bathwater and we're going to maintain these resources um, to try and help us with, with other things that are happening. So I don't like, know if you're necessarily like conspiracy theory time here. Put on your tinfoil hats if you got them. Okay, sure. I'm thinking it. Jim uh-huh. Ryan, he knew it was coming. <laughs> he knew that this was coming down the flag and he's like, I am getting out of Dodge before everybody <laughs> knows how bad I messed this up. Because I was on his watch. That's and true. this is a lot to take in. This is this is bad. Like they basically blew three and a half billion plus whatever money they put into to continue development on Destiny and all that other stuff. And like it's blown up in their faces. It could be that Destiny goes down, Marathon doesn't get completed. You know, this project that they no, spin that's out. Like, with yeah, people. that's worst case, worst case scenario, right? And like, that's the thing is like, when you've made this investment, right? Like, it's kind of like in the stock market, right? Like, you don't lose money until you sell, right? If you buy, and this is not financial advice, right? But if you buy 100 shares of a stock at 10 bucks a pop, and then they all drop down to $5, right? Like, you, you've lost $500, right? But you've only lost five hundred dollars if you sell the stock right if you hold on to it and it appreciates and it goes back it goes to 10 it goes to 11 it goes to 12 well now you're back in the green right now you or you're back in the black so it's like that's that's what they've got to be doing the calculus on right now is we spent three and a half billion dollars on bungee right we and then sp- some for, for the and finishing then some right yeah. we we invested in these properties we invested in these games they need to happen right like it, i think it would require like an absolute firestorm disaster for sony to basically pull the plug on the whole thing there's no way because then they're basically selling the stock right then they're basically saying yeah we're just going to take it in the teeth on this no way no way they are going but they are going to get every last dime they can get out of bungie and that's why they're spinning out the studio that's why they're integrating those 155 staff right because they want to try and produce value to work towards the three and a half billion and then some to get the money back right i don't know this feels like it's already there it feels like it's already at catastrophe level five because the thing is, is that they let go all these people and part of Pete Parsons' uh, message there was like, oh, we overextended, we were overambitious, uh, and we just didn't have the resources to kind of keep all these projects going. But now you're telling me you're going to maintain Destiny, work on Marathon with like a third of your staff gone? Like, and then to me that screams like, we're going to crunch these people hard yeah and then yeah. how many people are you gonna lose from that or people who are just like i don't want to be here anymore or like just the overall yeah. morale to get this done yeah. i feel like it's just in a tailspin now and like you said yeah. let's just get the 155 that we think will work at sony we're gonna get that little project that looks promising that we might turn into something good let's get that the heck out of there and it would not shock me if in a couple of months or something they're just like or maybe not a couple, maybe like a year, they're like, Bungie's just quietly closed. I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 do, I disagree strongly with that. I think, um, I agree that it looks really bad right now. I agree that the morale at Bungie's probably in the toilet. Um, and it's going to be hard to attract good talent, even if things turn up, right? Like, even if things start looking better and... You know they they stabilize their revenue Just flow. The talent that they got right now is going to be hard. Yeah, yeah. No, I, well, well. Here's the other thing too: the market freaking sucks, right? So, like, even though the morale is bad, a lot of the video game devs are sitting there like, "Well, what am I going to do? <laughs> you know, where am I going to?" Yeah, but go? how many of those devs are there? Are like, man, this sucks. Why don't we just go do our own thing now? Or maybe mm-hmm. they start to present their ideas to Sony and say, "Hey, spin us out too. Well, Get us out." I well, and that's the thing is like, I I think Sony would be like, no, <laughs> Sony would be like, okay, we're not gonna like faction out this team anymore. Like we spun out one good project, but we're not gonna like take on all these other various pet projects because we need the core property to make us money. Um, 
So I think that they wouldn't necessarily indulge that. And then on the other part, in terms of like just having them leave to like make their own studio, just because again, like if you just look at the, if you just look at the landscape in general, right? Like if you go and start your own studio, you go find some venture funding or whatever, um, you know, you still got to pay those heads. You got to feed those mouths. You got to, you got to pay for the office space or not. Right. If you're doing remote, like it, it's, it's, it's definitely a very tumultuous, you know, tumultuous path that I think the majority of the staff will likely end up saying, Hey, this sucks. I don't like working here. Um, I'm really Man, are you going to get like a, a completely crap game for a marathon that's going to tank as soon as it comes out? <laughs> I mean, I don't know, man. I don't know. I'm hoping. I'm hoping that the you know the game will deliver, and we'll see. And again, like because it feels like for from everything that I've heard, destiny wise, it's like it's in maintenance mode. Like I don't. Where's the revenue coming in? It's just going to cost them to keep that game going. From from all the rumors that I've read, it's going to be like if there's an expansion, it'll be really tiny and sure. maybe even free. Like they've sure. gotten, I think, the money they can out of that game. So, yeah. like, how soon until Destiny just shuts down? You know, because they're not going to be making any money off of it. Yeah, I mean, well, I don't. Yeah, I don't know what the revenue stream looks like, right? Like, I don't know, you know, what what you know, add on purchases, season passes, you know, new new folks coming in. Because I know they were talking about revisiting the strategy to make Destiny a bit more accessible. Because again, the game is older. And much like World of Warcraft, it can feel really intimidating to try and like get into that game if you haven't played it for the last seven years, you know, like you, you're not going to you're not going to be like, oh, cool, I want to go play Destiny. It's like, well, do you have level 554, you know, uh, guns and is your DPS where it needs to be for raids and like everything else? Right. Like it's it can be a lot more intimidating. And so I know there are some strategy or there are some rumors about them kind of rebranding to try and get in a new wave of players by making the game more accessible, et cetera. But anyway, we've been on this one for a while. I think at the end of the day, this is awful. I'm feeling for all the folks who got laid off. I think that Bungie has a steep uphill climb. um, And Sony is definitely going to be trying to get its money back. And we'll see how successful both of those companies are doing both of those things. Um, So uh next up college football 25 needed ai to get over the finish line um by michael mcwerder over at polygon says college football 25 wouldn't have been possible without ai ea gloss says uh ea sports college football 25 marks the return of a beloved sports sim franchise and according to electronic arts ceo andrew wilson the game couldn't have been made without developers utilizing machine learning and ai powered technology in an investor call on Tuesday, Wilson said in prepared remarks that creating 150 unique stadiums and over 11,000 player likenesses for College Football 25 couldn't be done without EA's deep history of being a technology leader and by our incredibly passionate and talented teams harnessing the power of AI and machine learning. Wilson later, later clarified these remarks, saying that player likenesses, which he called heads, and stadiums weren't purely generated by AI and machine learning. Oops. EA, very talented artists, supplemented that algorithmic work by touching up and enhancing the player's likenesses, Wilson said, as opposed to having to go through the full head development programs. Wilson noted that in any given year, EA will develop about 500 to 1,000 star heads for one of its sports games. The 11,000 that were needed to represent the players featured in College Football 25 was obviously a much bigger challenge. In the absence of AI, we simply would not have been able to deliver College Football at the level we did, even though we've been given the team many, many years in development. It was a decision that we made because we were really building the franchise for the future. It was the first time we had done it in 10 years, and the level of gameplay and the level of visual fidelity that we did was a combination of many years of work of our incredible teams, amplified and accelerated by AI, something that we just wouldn't have been able to do as little as two or three years ago. Uh, The reliance on AI and machine learning won't be limited to college football 25, uh, Wilson noted. The EA CEO said that the follow-up to this year's EA Sports FC 24, the replacement for its FIFA franchise, will also use AI tech. Quote, following a historic brand relaunch embraced by players, fans, and partners the world over, EA Sports FC 25 is going to be a giant step forward. FC 25 will feature more innovation as well as more realistic and authentic gameplay driven by enhanced tactical sophistication using AI 
in the real world with both data. Well, I, for one, welcome the arrival of our robot overlords. What do you think, Alan, about this, the use of AI in game development? So, like, I think that we've done a lot of stories on AI and, like, what it means for, for you know, game development. And I think that this is what we'd like to see. We like to see that, oh, yeah, the AI went in and did the base sort of work to get the artist started. And the artist then went in and did the finer detail work to make the player look the way they're supposed to look. And right. that allowed our group of artists to make those 11,000 heads, which is a lot. That's not a, an insignificant number. And, you know, being in college, you know, players are graduating and then you have new freshmen coming in. So you have to account for all of that uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, account for any changes, in, like big changes, like in hairstyle or anything like that. So I think that uh, this feels like as long as he's being honest and it wasn't just, you know, AI churn out the whole thing. Yeah, um, he had to go back and clarify what, his comments. People are like, "Is that right? AI did all of it?" Huh? He's like, "No, no, no, no. Like, our artist did stuff. I promise." Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, so if if it's the way you know, when his clarified comment of the AI they just did the kind of like the base work of getting started and taking a lot of that grunt work out of it, and then a lot of artists who just go in and do what they do best, which is make these players look accurate and good in the game. Then I think this is a good use of AI. I don't see any issue with with AI being used in this way in game development. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it, it. I agree. I think that AI can be used in you know in good ways, and this is one of them, right? Like if you're mass producing, you know, these models to kind of have a slightly tweaked baseline that you then have artists come in and apply the you know the finer details to it now you know playing devil's advocate i mean well here's the thing devil's advocate would say well somebody could have it could have been somebody's job to make those baselines but the advocate for that advocate i guess <laughs> would be that um that they just wouldn't have done it Right, they wouldn't have had so many devils. Model. <laughs> yeah, so many devils. Um, they would have just had you know the usual five to five hundred to a thousand. And so, I think that this is a way to expand, you know, the diversity in assets uh, versus what you know uh, the standard team would be able to to deliver. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm I I think that this would be an example of how I would hope AI could be used in the future. Um, not, hey, we have an AI system generate an entire, you know, background environment and all of the characters and the dialogue and it also ran the translation and, you know, whatever. Like, like needs to be human involvement at every step, right? Like that, that level of creativity uh, needs to be there. Um, but for some of the more mundane or repetitive work, or even just work that helps to kind of flesh out the world a bit more, that would be very demanding on bandwidth and man hours for AI to be able to support with that. I'm cool with it. I'm cool with it. Um, all right, last story. Uh, Sony Santa Monica is working on a new IP. A former developer has returned to the studio. This is by uh, George Yang over at GameSpot. Uh, Sony Santa Monica is reportedly working on its first new IP since the God of War series in 2005. According to an employee's LinkedIn profile in the About section, they came back to Sony Santa Monica as a character supervisor, looking at the entire character development pipeline on a new IP. Previously, they worked at both Naughty Dog and Sony Santa Monica before going to Striking Distance Studios uh, to work on the Callisto Protocol and Unknown Worlds for the next Subnautica game. Um, after the launch of God of War Ragnarok on PS4 and PS5 back in 2022, producer Corey Barlog said that the studio was working on many different projects. However, he didn't provide specifics on any of them. Sony Santa Monica also reported the working on an open-world sci-fi game before it was canceled. It seems like we might not see the new IP for a while, as Sony already said that there wouldn't be any new major franchise games until April 2025 at the earliest. In the meantime, God of War Ragnarok is coming to PC on September 19th. PS5 fans can look forward to games like Astrobot, Concord, and Lego Horizon Adventures later this year. Um, I'm stoked. I'm a fan of Sony Santa Monica, uh, and uh, I'm happy to see whatever it is that they've got cooking. So I say let them cook. 
yeah, I can't wait to see this running on my PlayStation 7. That's all I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> hey, come on. It, no, it'll be the PlayStation 6 and a half. It'll be like the, it'll be in the mid, mid level. The PlayStation 6 grid, Pro. Grid. That's my bad. Yeah, PS6. Pro. PS6 Pro. That's what it'll be. Um, no, but yeah, it, it is interesting. I, I do want to see like what they'll do next because they have been sort of the God of War studio since like, what, 2016, 2015-ish? Yeah, yeah. Um, So, you know, just seeing what else they're capable of. I mean, like, they show that they definitely have, like, a, a diverse skill set there because they, they put out that, um like, that update. It was December of last year where it became kind of almost like a Hades 2, but, like, God of War take on that. So seeing them start something from completely fresh from scratch is, is exciting. Uh, but yeah, it's it's gonna be a while, but uh, I think that it'll probably be awesome. Yeah, no, I agree. I think um, I'm like I said, I'm I'm interested in letting him cook and seeing what comes out. Um, you know, again, I think Ragnarok was great. Um, the DLC was awesome, and all the tweaks and stuff that they've been making. So I'm looking forward to them digging into a new new IP and and what comes out of that. So. Uh, no deals uh, to report today, so I think that does it for us uh, for this longer than usual episode. Uh, thank you for for the by uh, the robust discussion today, Alan. I appreciate it. Yeah, now before we go, if you're listening and you enjoyed it, please leave us reviews on whatever podcast platform you're using. Oh yes, please uh, give us give us a like, give us a give us a review that helps us out. Um, something you know, I was I was listening to to kind of funny earlier, and something Greg kind of went on a rant about you know supporting the the content that you love, uh, and you know I would be I would be delighted if our content is some of that content that you love. I would be privileged and honored, and if that's the case, the way that you can support us is by providing us with reviews uh, and letting us know how we're doing. Um, we also have Patreon for the Geekly Grind that you're welcome to support at. Um, but you know, if you don't have any bucks to to toss our direction, then um, reviews are great. Quote tweets, retweets, uh, anything like that. Likes, so, follows, likes, follows, all that good stuff. There's a lot of ways that you can support the creators and content that you love without having to spend any money in this internet age, which is awesome. Uh, and so, yeah, thanks so much for listening. Uh, until next time, I'm Jeremy. I'm Alan. Keep gaming, everybody. See ya.